He said, quote, This is very unfair, Rev. This gives discriminating protection, end quote, to the Negro. We don't have to stop at 1866. We don't have to stop at 1866. Take a look at the, at the legislative history of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 in our lifetimes. In now, you all in this room know that I do not oppose any effort to advance the fortunes of African Americans. I didn't accuse you of that. You re- do you, you disagree re- with anything I just said? No, you just cited the historical record about certain pieces of legislation. No, I don't dispute it. I understand that. I'm saying the year is 2023. I say it now for a third time. What country are we going to have here and what's going to be the crucible of law that governs our interrelationships with one another? All right, good afternoon. I'm Greg Burnett from the Political Science Department, and I want to welcome you to our annual Constitution Day event here at Holy Cross. Constitution Day, which fell on a Sunday this year, commemorates the signing of the U.S. Constitution on September 17th, 1787. And here's a fun fact about Constitution Day. Holy Cross, like all educational institutions that receive federal money, is actually legally required to hold an educational program related to the Constitution on or around Constitution Day. So, feds, if you're listening, we are fulfilling our our duty here today. Uh, This year, we are incredibly fortunate to have three distinguished guests. I'll introduce them in a moment and they'll take us the rest of the way on the subject of affirmative action in higher education. This is a topic that I and several of my colleagues have been eager to discuss on our campus and it has taken on even more significance in the wake of the recent Supreme Court ruling from just a few months ago. And so I'm really excited about uh, today's event. Let me briefly introduce the participants. Glenn Lowry is the Merton P. Stoltz Professor of the Social Sciences and Professor of Economics at Brown University. Professor Lowry is also a Paulson Fellow at the Manhattan Institute, and he hosts a weekly podcast called The Glenn Show, which I highly recommend. It's at the top of my podcast feed. Professor Lowry's many achievements include being chosen as a distinguished fellow of the American Economics Association. He's also a fellow of the Econometric Society and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the author of many articles and books, including the 2002 book, The Anatomy of Racial Inequality. Randall Kennedy is the Michael R. Klein Professor at Harvard Law School. Professor Kennedy has written numerous articles and books, including the 1998 book, Race, Crime, and Law, for which he received the Robert F. Kennedy Book Award. Professor Kennedy served as a law clerk for Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall and is a member of the Bar of the District of Columbia and of the Supreme Court of the United States. He is also a member of the American Law Institute, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the American Philosophical Association. Renu Mukherjee is a Paulson policy analyst at the Manhattan Institute. She is also a PhD student at Boston College, where she studied American politics and is currently working on a dissertation about affirmative action. Renu's work has been published in a variety of places, including the Wall Street Journal, and the New York Times. And I have to add, just as I am a proud alum of Holy Cross, so is Renu. So it's welcome back, Renu. Uh, Welcome uh, professors Lowry and Kennedy, and thank you so much for being here with us today. Uh, I'm gonna pass it off to Renu now and take it away. Great, thank you. So on June 29th, just Three months ago or so, the Supreme Court, in a 6-3 decision, invalidated the use of affirmative action within the context of higher education admissions, holding specifically that Harvard College and the University of North Carolina's race-conscious admissions policies violated the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. Now, before getting into 
a discussion of the decision itself and the broader implications for higher education admissions. I think it's worth discussing and defining what exactly we mean by affirmative action. The phrase has meant different things at a policy level at different points in U.S. history, and even the name itself and what it means today is viewed as contentious. So Glenn, I thought I'd begin with you and ask you, what do we mean in 2023 in the context of higher ed by affirmative action? How does it currently work? Well, basically what we mean is extraordinary efforts uh, aimed at uh, increasing the representation of underrepresented groups within the uh, body that's being selected, higher education, the student body. So we mean using different criteria of selection conditioned on the identity of the applicants in order to make the decision about whether or not to admit them. Would you agree with that, Randy? Yeah, I think that's, I think that's fair as it goes. I think it's actually a bit broader. So that was focusing purely on the question of selection. I mean, you know, giving a boost to certain people based on, you know, their perceived characteristics. Um, I think it, affirmative action could be viewed a bit broader because, you know, uh, for instance, um, recruitment yeah. is, you know, making a special effort to uh, recruit people based on uh, their characteristics or financial aid. Uh, I think it has, it, it, it can be broader, but I, I embrace the general idea. The general idea is you're giving a boost uh, to, you know, s some people uh, as opposed to others based on the characteristics of the people for whom you're given the boost. Now, you could have weaker or stronger affirmative action mm -hmm. than the spirit that Randy has just suggested. You could have using lower test scores, call that a strong version of affirmative action. You could have investing resources in reaching out to communities, encouraging applications and whatnot, call that weak affirmative action. So you might want to inject the term racial preference to identify those aspects of affirmative action, which I think the court has found to be most objectionable. Uh, I don't know that the decision forecloses a university from sending recruiters into a community or you know, petitioning uh, uh, potential suppliers of students of underrepresented groups, say, if you got a kid who's worth our consideration, that kind of thing. Now, before, again, getting into the decision itself, I'm just going to uh, prod a little bit more about, you know, your points that there's weak affirmative action in the sense of recruitment efforts and there's strong affirmative action. If you both could say a little more about the issue in this case of how affirmative action was practiced in the context first of Harvard College's admissions, similarly, the University of North Carolina's, the specific use of, you know, admissions tips or racial preferences in this case? Well, here we have a bit of, um, it gets a bit, a bit murky. And it gets a bit murky because, um, for instance, uh, Glenn used the term racial preference. Undoubtedly, the people who oversee affirmative action at my home institution, Harvard University, and the people who oversee affirmative action at the at the University University of North Carolina would reject that. They would say, "No, we're." You know, they would they would run away from that. They would say, "We don't we don't engage in any sort of racial preference." They and in fact, they probably wouldn't even use the term affirmative action. They would they would say, "We are engaged in a diversity program." And yes, it has a racial component, but it has all sorts of components. It has a gender component. It has a geography component. Uh, you know, we we reach out to try to get the, you know, the the, the youngster from. Uh, we we try to get you know um, urban youngsters. We try to get uh, rural youngsters. Uh, we are on the lookout for diversity in all of its various forms. Uh, race is just one of those forms. That's what the schools would say. And is there something to it? Yeah, there's something to it. But there is a reason why uh, when we're talking about diversity, when we're talking about affirmative action, there is a reason why, for instance, African Americans always show up very prominently. And the reason why African Americans, to, to some, maybe a somewhat lesser extent, Latino 
Latino Americans, but certainly African Americans. If we if we're going to discuss this issue, it'd be very prominent uh, because you know when you when you really get down to it, you know what's the fight about? The fight is about these institutions. They're selective institutions. They have you know scarcity of seats. They've got to dole out these scarce, highly coveted seats, and uh, they want to make they they want to make sure that um, uh, people from certain groups show up in these seats. And in order to ensure that they show up, uh, they give a boost to, you know, various, uh, to, 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 to people who have historically been marginalized, people who they think need the boost or else, you know, maybe people in that, you know, that demographic would be maybe entirely absent, or if they weren't entirely absent, there would be very few. Uh, let me remind everybody here that Students for Fair Admissions, where the plaintiffs in the cases at hand represent Asian aspirants to be admitted to these institutions. They claim that they're being discriminated against by the efforts that Randy has happily described that are oriented toward increasing the presence of African Americans. The data, uh, the background data that you can find if you look up the uh, briefs from the expert witness representing the Students for Fair Admissions, Peter Arcidiakono and his colleagues, which I signed on to, by the way, uh, are unequivocal. If you happen to be an Asian American, conditional on the quality of your academic credentials, your probability of being admitted is substantially less, an order of magnitude in some instances less than if you're an African-American. That's the crux of the matter. There's injury. Is, there's no free lunch here. It's a zero-sum game. There's injury to people based upon their race. That's what the court is objecting to. Let's, let's get into it. See, I, 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 I reject that. And let me say why I reject that. Um, it seems to me there's a big difference between somebody saying that they have been disadvantaged by a policy. So in this particular case, uh, you have uh, Asian American plaintiffs. By the way, I just drop a little footnote. It is interesting how in the case, as it turns out, the Asian American plaintiffs are reduced to virtual invisibility. There's not much talk about the Asian American, you know, about Asian Americans actually in the, in the court's decision, a bit more in Justice Thomas's concurrence, but in the court's decision, it's striking how little discussion there is of, of Asian Americans. But in any event, my main point, it's one thing for somebody, a group, Asian American students to say that they are disadvantaged by something. I think they are. I'm not going to fight that. And they clearly are disadvantaged. That's very different than saying that they were discriminated against. I, would, I, I think that's a very important distinction to be made. And here's what I mean. Please. Here's what I mean. So um, you have 100 seats. You have 100 seats. And um, let's suppose that the university takes the position that it wants to, in, you know, in, in allocating these hundred seats, let's, let's imagine that they say, we want to make sure that um, some of the seats, some of the seats go to, and you, you could just, you know, um, some of the seats go to groups that have historically been disadvantaged in American life. It may very well be that Asian American students are disadvantaged by that. When I think of discriminated against, my view of it should what we should have in mind is an invidious discrimination. So my last my last book was called what on this subject was called for discrimination because frankly discrimination can mean all sorts of different things. What should be what should be verboten which should be outlawed, which should be prohibited, 
is invidious discrimination. Uh, in institutions saying, we are going to take this policy because we don't like them. We want to limit them. We want to marginalize them. Like what was done at my university vis-a-vis, -vis, for instance, Jews in, uh, the, in, the, in the early 20th century. Uh, that's not what was going on. That is not, that's not what's going on now with uh, Asian American applicants. Asian American applicants are being disadvantaged. You know, they are paying a collateral price for an effort to help out African Americans, Latino Americans, others. I don't view that as being discriminated against. We're, we're quibbling over words now. The fact of the matter is, I had a 1600 on the SAT combined. Mm -hmm. I had absolutely brilliant uh, advanced placement uh, track record and whatnot, and I'm Asian. A vetting process comparing me to other students leaves me coming up short because I'm Asian. Now, you may say there's no invidious motive there. I, I tell you that if we were to change the circumstances ever so slightly, move to Silicon Valley instead of being at Harvard or UNC, let the number of African-Americans seeking employment there with qualifications be whatever it is and find the proportion of the students, of the individuals hired by those companies who are African-American being an order of magnitude less than some other group. We wouldn't be counting angels on the head of a pen talking about whether or not the motivation for the behavior was invidious. We would be using the uh, empirical facts at hand to establish the reality of the discrimination against those people. I mean, if you don't like the word discrimination, we don't have to use it. But the fact is, they are being treated differently because of their race. That's the, um, that's the thing that's being objected to. They are being treated differently because of their race? Uh, that's what I, no, I think, no. I, I would, they're not being treated differently because, because of their race. The objection is you're giving a boost to African-Americans because of their race. And this boost is collaterally disadvantaging other people, white people, uh, it, it, white people, uh, Asian it, Americans. It, excuse me. It's a zero sum situation. If yes. I discriminate in favor of something, just as Robert says this in his opinion, I'm perforce discriminating, quote unquote, against the other, or if you want another word, find it. But you had 100 slots. If you had a laissez-faire of a no intervention policy, these number of seats going to a group would have been whatever, 20. With your policy, it's 10. They're disadvantaged to that extent by your policy. They are just, again, I remember, I said, yes. Oh, but you are, don't like they it are disadvantaged. because of their race. They when are, I say because of their race, that's what you're objecting to, because it's not that they're Asian, that they're being disadvantaged, that they're not black. Again, I think yes. we're quibbling about words. Well, I mean, you call it a quibble. I don't, I don't say it's a quibble. It's a distinction. I think it's an, I think it's an important moral distinction. Well, related to what you were just, the context you were providing, Randy, what's really interesting about this case and specifically the dissents is that since 1978's Regents of the University of California versus Bakke, the legal justification that the court has provided for the consideration of race in higher ed admissions has been diversity. But in the two dissenting opinions in this case uh, from Justices Sotomayor and Ketanji Brown Jackson, diversity is not necessarily spoken of as a justification. They're, the justification they defend is really kind of what you're trying to get at, which is due to the historical abhorrent discrimination against Black Americans in the United States, that there ought to be an admissions tip or some boost provided. It's much more of a compensatory justice sort of framework. So I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit more and what, what are your thoughts that diversity has been the going legal rationale, but it seemed to not even find a place in the dissents in this case. I'll let Randy expound on that, but I just want to say briefly that um, the court has never endorsed the position. The court, mm -hmm. Justice Marshall endorsed the position to be sure, but the court has never endorsed the position that racial preferences are uh, allowed as an instrument to redress historical uh, mm -hmm. injustice. 
it's always been uh, on Justice Powell's argument that the diversity provided a rationale that was a compelling public interest, which if pursued with narrow uh, instruments uh, would be permissible. So I was left thinking I didn't know exactly who uh, Justices Sotomayor and, and Brown ja uh, Jackson were arguing against because um, well, the court's position has never been the position that they set out in their dissents. I think you're right. Uh, if, if, if all you're concerned about is what they say, the fact of the matter is that there's been, has long been double talk about this subject. So Justice Powell in the famous Bakke decision of 19, what was it, 1976, uh, says, well, uh, he, he, he rejects uh, racial affirmative action, a racial boost for, you know, com uh, remedial purposes, compensatory justice purposes, uh, integration, modeling. He rejects it for a whole host of reasons. The one thing that he, sa he says, well, but you, you can have affirmative action if the purpose is diversity. The idea being, uh, uh, you know, if you if you can if if a school says we'll have a better scholarly slash intellectual environment if we have people from all over the place, you know, getting together, uh, we we will we'll have a better schooling environment. And 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 Powell says, well, that's compelling. Now, frankly, that's what he said. And because he had this very powerful position, because he was the swing vote, once he said that, everybody got in line. And so since he said he was he he talked this diversity talk, everybody else started talking diversity talk. You know, he said, you know, he said, well, this is this is what moves me. And so everybody started talking diversity talk. Is that what was really going on? I don't think so. I don't think even with him. I don't think that was what was really going on. I think actually, I think the 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 remedial justification, in my view, has that was really what was propelling things. They didn't say it. In fact, they rejected it. Why? Well, I mean, according to for, for a variety of reasons, I think uh, one not they didn't want to open up the door to this. You know, there there were there were various features of the remedial justification that made them very nervous. One being, for instance, you know, when will this end? Um, and if you open the door up for remedial justification with respect to, co you know, uh, college admissions, what else? So I think that there was a feeling that this diversity rationale would be more manageable. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I used to, I used to scoff at the diversity rationale. I really, I used to scoff at it because I thought that it was so made up. I don't think that was what was really going on. And I, I thought it was so vulnerable to attack. Um, but, you know, the people who sort of got behind Powell, the people who sort of beat the drum for diversity, I think over time, this, this slogan, the rationale of diversity, became a very serviceable rationale in a way that I don't think, I, I, I certainly didn't see, you know, when it first came out. Well, One of the things that's very serviceable about it is and I think this will really resonate with you, Glenn. I know, you know, with some of your objections. One of the things that I think is attractive about the diversity rationale is that unlike the rationale of compensatory justice, the diversity rationale does not concede uh, that, uh, let's say, racial minority candidates are in any sense any weaker than other candidates. In fact, the diversity rationale allows the minority candidate 
to actually argue we're better. We're bringing something special and, you know, very important and valuable to the table. I think it's the, probably the first time in American in life where there was an official rationale on the part of the government that actually gave a nod, actually gave, you know, value to blackness. And I think that that was one of the attractions of the diversity rationale. To you? I'm sorry? Are you attracted by the idea that African-Americans would be reduced to chits, representative of some abstraction of diversity, not seen as persons in themselves, but rather as instruments to some uh, larger kind of moral passion play, and that the law would be non-transparent and, in fact, dishonest Mm -hmm. in representing its purposes, such that the underlying popular support for the policy would wither as people recognize themselves to have been gaslighted by talk about diversity, which is really, frankly, bullshit? A um, couple things. Um, I, I remain, well, let, me, let, me, let me put my cards on the table, and I'd be interested to see exactly where Glenn disagrees with me. Proposition one. I think the Supreme Court of the United States was profoundly wrong in saying that the Constitution prohibits public universities and any private university that's getting federal funds from engaging in uh, any sort of race-conscious selection scheme. And the reason why I think that's so profoundly wrong is The Supreme Court of the United States has actually put off the table the sort of discussion that we're having. I mean, you've you've got criticisms, and I think very good criticisms, of affirmative action, which might prompt a person like me to say, in light of your criticism, you know, you've convinced me about this. Maybe, Maybe we should tighten it up somewhat. Maybe we should not have it as broad. Maybe we should do this. Maybe we should do this. Maybe we should experiment this way. Maybe we should experiment that way. The Supreme Court's position, given what it decided, no, you can't do that. We can't. There there is no debate. There is no debate. This is off the table of regular politics. That is my main objection to what the Supreme Court said. As for affirmative action, You know, I think that affirmative action is like any other public policy. You can have you can have stupid tax policy. You can have stupid affirmative action. At the same time, you can have very useful, valuable tax policy. And I think that you can have very useful, valuable affirmative action. Yeah. uh, You are reprising the argument from your fine book for discrimination. It's a policy, not a fundamental constitutional issue. shouldn't be decided Mm -hmm. in that way. That sounds a little bit like the argument some of the pro-life people made about the Roe versus Wade decision. You're taking it out of the purview of politics and discretion, and you're making it into a constitutional right. But I don't want to get us off on the side track. Uh, Where do I come down on that? I'm not a constitutional lawyer. Uh, I'll just stipulate that. Um, I read Justice Thomas's long historical review of the uh, framing of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution and of the uh, uh, concomitant legislation that was going on in the Congress in the period immediately after the Civil War. And he concludes that the amendment means no, it means what it says, no discrimination means no discrimination by race. And it's race that is different from um, from other characteristics and the historical context of that amendment's ratification, it's being understood now by the court as saying, you can't discriminate by race. Um, I think we're in the 21st century and the Constitution has to be the guiding framework for our law going forward. I think my personal view, interpreting the 14th Amendment in that way is a good, not a bad thing for this dynamic, multi-ethnic, multi-racial society going forward into the 21st century. I think the black-white dichotomy or bilateral opposition 
is an historical relic. It's an anachronism. Uh, I think the fact that it was Asian students who brought these cases, these are aspiring Americans who are second, third generation immigrants from non-European ports of call who are in substantial part the future of this country. I think a legal dispensation in which that kind of identitarian dimension, you talk so casually about students being disadvantaged, these African-American students running around the Ivy League campuses that you and I inhabit are on the whole not injured, disadvantaged, subjugated par uh, parties. They are substantially from people from the upper middle class. They are uh, people who are, are very privileged individuals in their own personal biography. So I'm okay with what the court has done here uh, in interpreting the 14th Amendment from my non-lawyerly uh, posture. Um, but I, I recognize some of the concerns because it doesn't have to be limited to college admissions. Mm -hmm. This this idea, once you let it out of the uh, out of the uh, out of the barn, so to speak, uh, could have very far reaching uh, implications. And we're going to find out what litigants who are uh, activists on the right are going to do with it. But um, so I, I appreciate. So I'm saying in summary, I appreciate the concern. But I think as a as a pragmatic matter that uh, the right decision was rendered in this case. Can I just say on, on the decision, um, you know, there was that footnote in the court's opinion, footnote four, where it says that this opinion does not touch the service academies. This opinion does not touch, you know, the Naval Academy, West Point, Air Force Academy, you know, whatever we're doing here doesn't touch the service academies. Well, the Supreme Court of the United States is saying that what Harvard was doing and what the University of North Carolina was doing was a type of unconstitutional discrimination. Justice Thomas was saying that what these universities was do with these universities were doing was tantamount was morally, legally the same as segregation. Are we to take that seriously in light of them saying, but what we're talking about doesn't have anything to do with the service academies? Does, I mean, does that, does that come through? Let, let me respond to that. Yeah. This, here's how I read it. Uh, first, I read Justice Roberts say, uh, the uh, practices at issue here do not pass strict scrutiny because... They're making claims about the benefits which are not verifiable and subjective to uh, judicial review. Very abstract. We say we're going to get more pedagogical benefits out of diversity. Well, where's the evidence that there's more pedagogical benefits? We say society will be better off if elite institutions are diverse in their racial composition. Where's the argument for that? That's very abstract. That's three moves down the line. I don't see how I would, as a court, ever verify whether that was true or false. With respect to the military, there's an argument. You can reject it, but there's an argument. The argument is the functioning of the institution depends upon uh, good uh, relations across the lines of hierarchy and authority within the military. It's the military, after all. Mm -hmm. We have historical experience, you know, officers tense getting fragged during Vietnam and that kind of thing, with what can happen when we have all white commanders and we have all black and brown uh, infantrymen. We want to avoid that. We think we found a way of doing that. I took that footnote to mean that that practice, unlike the diversity claims of the University of North Carolina and Harvard University, is subject to judicial review, is a measurable and empirically verifiable claim, and it's a claim that we stand behind. That's what I took them to be saying. The distinction between the military academy rationalization for affirmative action and the university's rationalization for affirmative action standing on very different empirical grounds. Well, I saw it as a dodge. We'll soon see. I understand from some of the papers that somebody is now suing West Point. It'll be interesting to see what the court says. Let me. Can I pose a, a hypo? Imagine. Let, let, let's imagine that we have a. a a, a, a university, public university, and, uh, you know, it does its best to admit students, just like this institution does its best to admit students. 
And at the end of the day, it it there are there are it, it's it's a racially homogeneous class, an all white class. It's public university. It's an all white class. Question: Is that a problem for you? Yeah. Well, you got to hum some bars, please. <laughs> I mean, if it, I mean, it, come it, on, it, your hypothetical is ridiculous, man. It's not going to be zero. It's going to be 4% instead of 12%. I mean, stick with my hypothetical. I'm, I'm, you know, there's a reason for a hypothetical. It's a bad outcome. Let's imagine it's, a, let's imagine it's zero. If it is zero, because the reason why I asked the hypothetical is because if one is a true color blindness person, which I'm not. Okay, I understand. Right. But, you know, Justice Thomas says he is. If if you are a true or forget Justice, there are people. I mean, I have friends who, you know, thoroughgoing, colorblind. If you are a true colorblindness person, the answer to my hypothetical should be no, actually. No, uh, it, 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 it doesn't matter. No. Uh. But look, look, but you look, but it, if it, it matters, the why predicate, does it matter? The why predicate matter? of your hypothetical is that somehow, in the application process, when race was not an explicit criterion of selection, mm -hmm. no African Americans qualify. Now, if that's the case, our problem is not the university. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, our problem is the development of the intellectual potential of African Americans. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I would want to address that. I would be very distressed about the outcome here, but it wouldn't, in my mind, be a justification for racial discrimination. I know you don't accept, accept that terminology. A, a, concern, a concern about racial inequality is one thing. The practice of racial discrimination yeah. is another thing. The former does not necessarily, and in the court's rendering, does not, in fact, justify the latter. We're talking about the law, I'd say to a law professor, not about social policy. Well, the law is social policy, but on this one, I think you and I agree, actually. I mean, what, what you're, it seems to me what, what your answer to me was, yeah, I'm concerned about it. And I would want to know why that's, you know, why that's so. And I would want to figure out, we, we, you know, we, what can we do to address that situation? Right. That doesn't necessarily mean, however, that we should have you know, racial affirmative action. That's my answer. Okay. I, and I, and I, and I think there's a lot, you know, I think there's a lot, uh, a lot to it. I do say, however, that, um, I, I would want to sort of push a little bit more as to why, you know, why someone might feel that there really is a, a problem. And I would, you know, I, I would want to sort of push that. And then I want to push, well, you know, do you think, just suppose, you know, someone argued that the problem could be assisted to some degree by some degree of, you know, racial affirmative action. So, Glenn, do you, do you mind an institution, for instance, like this one, making a special effort to market itself? to, you know, groups, let's say black Americans or could be Latino Americans that because of, you know, historical circumstances might not know about the opportunity presented by an institution like this. No, I don't mind that. You don't mind that. Okay. No, but I want to go back to something you said earlier about the diversity rationale, which is finally, and there's just something that black people can bring to the university that's a plus. I wasn't championing it. I just said, I think that's one of the reasons that people like it. What I want to say is the university is first and foremost a venue for the intellectual uh, achievement, performance, advancement of knowledge, teaching and learning, uh, and that having African-Americans' presence there be primarily justified in terms of their bringing a little bit of spice, a little leavening the loaf a little bit, bringing in a little bit of something that's interesting and whatever is a... Um, insult to African-Americans at the end of the day. And I don't mean to put words in your mouth in saying that. Uh, I think when we see a low presence of black people when judged by the same criteria as others, it's an alarm being sounded 
about the inadequate development of the human potential of Black people. I think that the use of different standards for selecting Black people in virtue of that lack of development is patronizing. I think it is an end run around a difficult historical problem, grappling with the consequences of the mistreatment of Black people over the ages so as to bring up the uh, and, and realize the full human potential of, of, of those youngsters. So affirmative action is a distraction, in my view, from the real problem. It's way too easy for administrators of elite venues to satisfy their uh, virtue signaling desires by objectifying African-Americans as representative of something which is exactly not what they are mainly there to do, which is advance the frontiers of knowledge, uh, cultivate excellence of intellectual performance, and so forth and so on. It's a university. I agree with much of what you said. I, I strongly reject your, you know, your sort of disdainful reference to these administrators simply engaged in virtue signaling. I don't think it was a cheap uh, shot. I, I can see. Okay, so you you can. <laughs> I, I, I withdraw. I withdraw. <laughs> <to say. laughs> I withdraw the question. Okay. <laughs> so you both mentioned the service academies footnote four, in which this decision does not apply to West Point, the Naval Academy, and as you uh, suggested, Randy, yesterday students for fair admissions officially filed a lawsuit mm, against right. West Point. Um, so it's very much going to come up again. We also saw that in August, Coalition for TJ filed a law, parent organization filed a lawsuit against Fairfax County School Board, Fairfax County Public Schools. That's Thomas Jefferson High School. School, yes, for the use of race or rather the consideration of racial preferences for admissions at uh, TJ, which is a uh, magnet school, selective public high school. So my question is, what do you both see as the next frontier of this? Do you think that colleges and universities will comply with the decision? Do you, How do you see, do you think the court will end up taking up the Thomas Jefferson High School case? Will perhaps a few years from now be responding, responding to the West Point case? Yeah, Pandora's box has been opened up yes. again. I'll <laughs> defer to the legal expert here, but it does seem to me to be that it's, there's no obvious stopping point. And I think that uh, it's, you know, the year is 2023. We, we started this business a half century ago. The country is changing. It's dynamic. I've already said that. I won't repeat myself. Uh, the developmental deficits that are reflected in the relatively lower academic performance of African-American aspirants for these selected positions need to be addressed on their own account. Um, I, I think that uh, there's going to be resistance. There, there are going to be workarounds. I, you know, it's not hard to imagine what the workarounds could be. You look for characteristics for selecting students that are, in effect, proxies for the racial identity of those students, but are not explicitly the racial identity of the students. And you use those characteristics, whether it be geographic location, socioeconomic status, uh, family composition, uh, and so forth, as uh, indirect instruments for composing your class of the demographic uh, profile that you find um, most desirable. And it's going to go to whether or not the motives, suppose I say, um, that, uh, as some uh, states have done, if you finish in the top 10% of your high school class, you're automatically admitted to my university. I don't care what your SAT score is. Suppose I say, you can apply here without even submitting an SAT score, and we will vet your application on its merits with no prejudice, but if you don't want to give us a score, we're not going to require you to have a score. I can do that, it seems to me, in a manner that's consistent with uh, the letter of the law. Um, and I think we're going to see a fair amount of that being done. And I think that's not a good thing. Uh, I think it's not a good thing for the institutions in question because those kinds of interventions, changing broadly the instruments used to assess the fitness of aspirants, are going to apply to everybody who seeks admission to the university, not just to members of the targeted population groups, 
And the consequence will be to change the character of the university student body uh, much more broadly in ways that I think are not consistent with the meritocratic uh, imperatives of an elite intellectual undertaking, which is what the university is. A couple things. One, starting with the, your last sentence, you know, that in a lot of these discussions, sometimes I think we lose sight of uh, the fact that in, in this particular, you know, our subject is dealing with a pretty small, very important, but small slice of higher education. I mean, you know, most schools actually, the great mass of colleges and universities in the United States are not selective. If you can, if you can pay, come on in. Yeah. Uh, you know, this school is selective and there, I don't know, I think there, you know, maybe 200 schools in the United States that are selective, but there are a lot of schools that are not. That's one. Two, um, I think that it's, it's, um, it's noteworthy that so much attention is paid to the fate of the elite schools and the elite people and relatively, and, and too little attention is paid to other folks. And this is a point that has been made by people on the left. It's also a point that's been made by people on the right. I mean, you know, so I've spent, you know, uh, people have spent a lot of time fighting, fighting, fighting over selection schemes, which will determine whether a student goes to, um, you know, Case Western Reserve Law School or Michigan State Law School versus the University of Michigan Law School. Well, frankly, if you're in a position to go to any of those law schools, you're doing pretty good. You've graduated from college. And if you were a plausible candidate to go to any of these select, you know, law schools, you did pretty well in college. But we spent, you know, we spent a huge amount of time um, you know, we're here together talking about the fate of people who actually they're gonna do okay. Relatively less time on the people, comparatively less time on the people who don't make it through high school. Or if they make it through high school, they make it through high school and they're functionally illiterate. This is something that we can agree about. Okay. And I think I think that's a very important affirmative action is a is about elites. It's about yes. the racial integration of elite. It's not egalitarian, not in the fullest sense of the of the word. It, it's about integrating elites. So um, yeah, we could spend a lot more time talking about K through twelve education yes. and talking about social policy for the disadvantaged more broadly, and might be advancing the needle on justice. Uh, more effectively in doing so, I, I agree. I mean, we're talking about what we're talking about. I just wanted to put that out there that you know, it's there. There are these other subjects, which and you know, question why is it that oftentimes they don't seem to get as much attention from people who are in elite institutions? I, you know, I think there's a reason for that. The you know, we're in elite institutions. We're interested in. Elite institutions, but you know there is a society out there with other things going on. Can I just say one other thing? There's, there's a, there is a justification for affirmative action that has not has never gotten, I think, the attention that it ought to get, and that is affirmative action as an insurance policy. So we all know, and I don't think you I, well correct me if I'm wrong. I bet it's the case that you would, would agree with me. That there is in our in society a lot, or an appreciable amount, an appreciable amount of racial discrimination that is flying in the face of racial minorities of various sorts. I'll just stick to Black Americans for the moment. There's sort of an invisible win. It's an invisible win. It's not like you're gonna, you know 
Mount Lawson about it, but it's there. And one thing that affirmative action does, I think, is um, signal, it's a, it's a signaling device from the institutions saying, we really do mean it when we say that we want to turn the page on the old regime. And one of the reasons why I think it's important to actually signal that is because in the living memories, in the living memory, I'm not talking about going, you know, long, long, long time ago when people weren't alive. In living memory, there are millions of people alive today who remember a time in the you know history of the United States when they would have loved to have had a single standard. They would have loved to have had a situation in which two people are just judge, you know, my test score, your yeah. test score, who got the best test score. Until relatively recently, until relatively recently, that was not the case. And I think that that really sticks in the craw of a lot of black people and it makes a lot of black people, frankly, very distrustful. Of an institute of institutions, you know, you're willing to trust the institution. I think a lot of people are not willing to trust the institution, and the only solace they find is in the bottom line. Show me some. I'm not going to trust you when you say that you're administering a test, the same test. You're you're treating everybody the same. They they believe the only thing I'm a trust is some bodies. Oh come on, Randy! I can't believe you're making this argument. I mean, you're playing. You're playing it. right I into the. You're playing right into Justice Roberts' head. His various uh, points that he was ticking off about what's pro what's the problem here. First of all, can't subject these claims to a judicial review. Secondly, negative impact on a group because it's a zero sum thing. Thirdly, stereotyping. You are taking individuals as representative of social aggregates, and you're treating them differently in virtue of that. You presume that the person who's African-American, because they're African-American, is carrying with them this burden of uh, historical memory. You uh, mete out uh, a recompense for that burden at the expense of people who have had nothing to do with the injury. And you want to do it forever. That was the fourth of uh, Roberts's uh, touchstones. There's no end to what you propose. So I ain't going with you on that. I mean, people need to grow up. Here, let me just say this. The year, I'll repeat myself, is 2023. This stuff has been going on for a half century. The country and the world are moving. They're moving fast. African Americans have to man up and woman up to the competition that we're all struggling to confront effectively. Don't make me and my people into wards of the admissions office of an Ivy League institution. Trust that we will, in the fullness of time, whatever the challenge, measure up to the challenge at issue. Special treatment because of what happened a half century ago? I reject that. Len, you, you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take off on your, your sentence. Quote, people need to grow up. The first federal civil rights statute in the United States was the Civil Rights Act of 1866. The Civil Rights Act of 1866 declared that all persons would have the same right as white persons to enter into contracts, to own property, to testify, to sue, and to be sued. The, the classic civil rights. That civil rights bill that was passed by the Congress was vetoed by the President of the United States. The President of the United States was Andrew Johnson. What did Andrew Johnson say when he vetoed the Civil Rights Act of 1866? He said, quote, This is very unfair, Rev. This gives discriminating protection, end quote, to the Negro. We don't have to stop at 1866. We don't have to stop at 1866. Take a look 
at the at the legislative history of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 in our lifetimes. When there was plenty of opposition to it uh, based on a variety of arguments around it. But what does that have to do with the question at hand? Rachel, what did what did Richard Russell say when he fought to reject Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act that prohibits racial discrimination at the workplace. He said his, his main line of attack, preferential treatment. Sam Irvin, preferential treatment. This line of preferential treatment has been, my point is, yeah. this, is this isn't new. This isn't new. This is a historical line of attack against any effort to advance the fortunes of African Americans. Now, you all in this room know that I do not oppose any effort to advance the fortunes of African Americans. I didn't accuse you of that. You do you, you disagree with anything I just said? No, you just cited the historical record about certain pieces of legislation. No, I don't dispute it. I oh. understand that. I'm saying the year is 2023. I say it now for a third time. What country are we going to have here and what's going to be the crucible of law that governs our interrelationships with one another? These are the questions. I'm saying this is not the answer to the problem. I'm saying, A, reducing people to representatives of these racial aggregates is a moral error. I'm saying, B, you cannot reverse the relative underdevelopment of a historically subjugated population by preferring them at the uh, points of uh, critical judgment about whether or not they're fit. Look, if you use different criteria to select students for highly competitive venues of intellectual competition, of intellectual work, like an elite university, necessarily you're going to get different performance from those students on average after they've been admitted. This is not equality. I'll take 6% over 12% if the 6% are actually qualified as much as anybody else in the competitive arena to do the thing that's most valued in that arena. This is why I so strenuously object to placing the value of African-American presence in these institutions on their representativeness in some kind of diversity argument, when in fact, we all know what the raison d'etre of these places is. It's getting published, it's writing books, it's uh, winning prizes, it's inventing ideas, it's mastery over canon. It's excellence. It's excellence in intellectual work. You create a special dispensation for African-Americans in these venues. You guarantee the patronization of African-Americans. You guarantee the looking the other way at mediocrity. That's not equality. One of the things that came out in these cases, certainly one of the things I learned, I mean, I've been, I've been, uh, I've been at Harvard University for now 39 years. I certainly learned a lot through the litigation, and some of what I learned was not pretty at all. I mean, actually, Glenn, the, 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 I wouldn't mind, actually, the, the, the sort of university that you just depicted. That, I mean, <laughs> if one of them actually existed. If one of them actually existed. That's not what was on, you know, what? So the... You know, the, oh, the athletes and the alumni. Yes, and the, 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 the cap, you know, the, 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 uh, the coach of this team, you know, of, of this sport gets nine. And then this person, you know, there was all sorts of stuff going on. Now that does not, we can only take that so far, but it seems to me. No, I got, I got to tell you this in the spirit of, of comedy. So Jay Caspian Kang is a writer and he's mm -hmm. been a guest on my podcast and we were talking about this. And he said, you know, I got a theory about the university. Here's what it is. The elite universities are about the rich kids. You got to have some really smart kids around, otherwise it wouldn't be an elite university, so you bring in some Asians. You got to have some blacks and browns around, otherwise it wouldn't be, you know, socially justice uh, oriented, which is part of the brand, so you bring in some blacks. But the real engine that's driving the show is the rich kids. So, I don't know, do we agree? On that one, I, you know, a lot of agreement. Wait, will you address yourself to my concern about the um, humiliation of being included within a uh, cadre of people who are supposed to be about intellectual excellence and you're hanging on by your fingernails because you came in at the bottom of the distribution of the test score thing 
which is a problem that needs to be addressed in and of itself. I think there's a lot to that, Glenn. You know, I, I, I think that there, and in fact, on, from, on my side, again, I'm part of the, you know, pro-affirmative action camp. But it seems to me a weakness in my camp, I think a weakness that's, you know, sort of, impelled by a certain almost feeling of, you know, defensiveness and desperation. Uh, you know, again, I said, you know, 30 minutes ago, some of the criticisms that you make, I think, are, are very strong. And this is one. It's there. Does affirmative action, for instance, stigmatize beneficiaries? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. What do you, you know, absolutely. And, and is that a cost? Sure, it's a cost. I tell you, you know, every at the beginning of the year, at the beginning of the year, on the very first day of class, when I go to the front of the class and, you know, I, I teach contracts, I go, hi, my name is Randall Kennedy. This is contracts. We're off. I know. And nobody, you know, nobody says anything. Yeah. But I know good and well that. There's a certain number of students in the, in the, in the, in the, you know, in the, there who are thinking to themselves, hmm, I, you know, I'm, I, you know, that guy is in front of me. Uh, is he as good as his colleagues? I don't think that they think that, you know, the university would put somebody unqualified in, in, in front of them. But I do think that they would, you know, they are asking a question. Okay, fine. Qualified. I mean, qualified is a minimal thing. Is this person in front of me as strong as his peers? And if he's not, I'm mad about it. I have no, I, I, I'm sure that that's there. Is that a cost? Yeah, that's a cost. Sure, it's a cost. But what I would say to you, Glenn, is, and then that's not the only one. There are, there are other costs that you've written about and that are, that are present. Question for me is, it's a cost. I think we should be concerned about it. I think that we should, when we are um, designing affirmative action plans, we should have that in mind. So, you know, question, should we have affirmative action at the professorial stage, as opposed to affirmative action for middle schoolers, high schoolers, college. I mean, you know, is there an argument that it's, you know, there should be a change as you sort of go up the ladder? Seems to me that's a very good thing to talk about. And maybe, maybe the answer to that is yes. But you also have to ask the question, you know, what about the benefits has the United States of America in the past 50 years been benefited by affirmative action? I've already conceded, yes, there are costs. I would also assert that, yes, it has been benefited. And we've seen this, you know, we've seen the benefits not only in the racial area, we've seen it in other areas. And just one last thing, and, I'll, and then I'll be quiet for a minute. In the affirmative action issue, it seems to me that people will remember, and here I'm going to go out of the race issue for a minute. There was a person who was running for the president who said the following, if you elect me president of the United States, I will promise you that if I get to put somebody in the Supreme Court of the United States, it will be a woman and it will be the first woman on the Supreme Court of the United States. Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan. That's right. Question. When Sandra Day O'Connor was put on the Supreme Court of the United States, did could Richard Posner and various other male jurists say that they were discriminated against? Okay, Rand. I, I think we got the point. And and I and I don't disagree uh with the, the spirit of your comment, but I want to I want to just shift ground a little bit. The question was, has affirmative action been on that beneficial to the United States? I, I could answer that in the affirmative. I, I could, without a difficulty, say, on the whole, 
go back 50 years, ask what the country would be like with and without, taking benefits and costs all into account Mm -hmm. on net. Sure. Um, We needed to open things up. Uh, The 1960s and 70s, a very critical historical moment. Uh, A lot of elite institutions, Lily White. When uh, the late William Bowen, former president of Princeton University and former president of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, uh, undertook a massive project at his foundation to try to justify affirmative action as we were headed toward those uh, uh, landmark cases and uh, the University of Michigan cases. I was a part of that effort. Uh, my research center at Boston University got small grants from the Mellon Foundation to do research. I wrote the foreword for the paperback edition of their book, The Shape of the River, in which, in effect, the argument was we're running uh, Princeton and Derek Bach, former president of Harvard, they co-authored the book. We're running elite institutions. We're shaping the leaders of this country going forward. Uh, we don't have enough black and brown leaders in this country. Uh, we want to contribute to solving that problem. We're going to do affirmative action. Yes, that's going to mean racial preferences to some degree. But let me look at the data and tell you what the consequences of having done so. On the whole, it's been positive, And I endorse that argument. That was a long time ago. I'm asking myself now the question, even if I can say retrospectively that on net this has been a positive for the country, is this the way we want to institutionalize doing business going forward indefinitely? And there I'm coming up with a negative. There I'm saying we have to wean ourselves. There there I'm thinking this is a state of exception that we've entered into with affirmative action from what otherwise would be um, the prudent Uh, and morally justifiable way of conducting our affairs with one another. So we've entered into a state of exception, and then necessarily the question is, how do we get out of it? And there's no way out except out. I don't want to quote Roberts. I know you know what he said. Do you want to stop discriminating? Then stop. I think actually at that, I think it might be worth opening the conversation. I'm sure a lot of the students have questions and would like to join in. Yeah, perfect timing. Um, so the students who'd like to ask questions, if you could just uh, make a line at the microphone, we'll get to as many as we can, All right? Okay, it's um, I apologize, my, my, my question might be a bit wandering because I'm terrible at organizing my thoughts the best of times. Um, so, during my time in A push in junior my high school, my teacher cited a study that stated that if all other sort of institutional barriers, any historical evidence were completely eliminated in terms of racial discrimination in the modern United States due to factors related to generational wealth, due to re- metrics such as sort of discrimination in the workplace or redlining or other practices, it would take an estimated 210 years for the average African-American family to quote unquote catch up to the average wealth bracket of the average white American family. Now, we have been talking about universities as their primary objective being the forwarding of learning and education, creating these incredibly bright minds. But I would argue that in the modern era, or not argue, I would state that in the modern era where increasing numbers of qualifications are necessary for jobs that pay ever less, wherein colleges increasingly offer opportunities for internships, even in these elite institutions where there's these informal references to the Ivy League clubs, wherein being from this particular institution affords you opportunities and access to other locations. Internships, career development centers like the fest that we're having outside until about two minutes ago. Uh, All of these are factors that are accessible through colleges and by by this metric, by affirmative action, this not only enables this sort of aggregate of greater access to the intellectual portion of what makes a university a university, but it also offers opportunities for these various other aspects of living in modern life, more quote unquote practical ones you might offer. And I think, and I've lost my train of thought, crap. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so... Yeah. um, Is there a response to that kind of notion? The secondary purpose of an institution to prepare somebody for entering modern life? Go to it. (laughs) Well, I mean, if the observation is 
it's a benefit to get a good education at a selective university. Uh, I think the answer to that is clearly, yes, that's a benefit. If the observation is that some groups in society say African Americans are historically disadvantaged for factors such as differences in the uh, generational wealth transmission process, yes, that's also correct. Nowhere have I heard an argument that discriminating against or in favor of people based upon their racial identity is justified uh, because of these uh, consequences. So um, I'm, I'm not sure how it's an argument for affirmative action, even though it's a correct observation about the benefits. I mean, it would, uh, you have your property, I'd be better off if I had your property. It doesn't give me a right to take your property. Should I elaborate or should I just, okay. So I had a question, which is that after when Brown v. Board um, uh, ruled against the use of race or, or ruled against racial discrimination, Southern institutions sought to loophole that decision by using other methods. But And it took a long time. It took decades uh, for the public to be universally united against r racial discrimination. Do you think that with the SFFA ruling that universities will do a similar thing, that they'll try to loophole and use and try even still try to use other methods that will indirectly use race? Uh, and will they do it, and are they right to do it? It's a wonderful observation. And uh, I think Professor Lowry said earlier that, yeah, they're going to do it. And in fact, uh, a lot of them will. Uh, and, and already, it's already happening. I mean, it's not, we don't have to sort of speculate. Yes, because I think a lot of these institutions are truly, you know, they, they're, they you know, strongly, ethically, ideologically committed to, you know, their you know, diversity. And they think that what the Supreme Court has in mind is going to really encroach upon that. And so they're going to try to figure out ways to, to get around it. Now, um, I think one really... Interesting issue is the whole question of what will the Supreme Court allow? So, this term race neutral, what does race neutral mean? So, the, you know, in Texas, in Texas, they have the top 10% plan. Uh, it, it, it doesn't say anything about race on its face. Yeah. But if you, you know, if you graduate the top 10% of your class in Texas, you can go to the, you know, the flagship university in, in Texas. Now, everybody knows why they did it. And the, one of the reasons, there were a variety of reasons, but one reason why they did it was because they wanted to have some way to uh, allow, you know, a, a, a number of African-Americans. It wasn't just African-Americans, you know, poor white rural people too, but African-Americans were, you know, part of it. Question: Is that race neutral? I think, Glenn, that what's going to happen. I think that the I think the Supreme Court. I my sense is they've laid this down. They're going to be. I think there's going to be a compromise. I think what they're basically going to say is you cannot explicitly have a race line. So you know the boxes are out. You can't explicitly do race, but you can do these indirect things. And that's and these indirect things are going to be deemed to be race neutral, and we're going to you know have them for the next you know twenty twenty five years, and that's going to be the compromise. That's what I think is going to happen. Yeah, that seems reasonable to me. They are already doing these things, like uh, some of them abandoning the use of standardized tests as a part of the admissions process. And I, I find it interesting because the real question here is motive. That is, if it could be demonstrated that there was a meeting, we have the memoranda, we have the whistleblower, and in the meeting it was said, we're not going to have enough blacks in this class. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Well, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll do a 10% plan. And then that was the motive. I don't see how it would withstand scrutiny. It's a little bit like, uh, I want to move this polling place. Uh, I want to ask for an ID before I allow you to cast the ballot. 
I'm a Republican. What's my motive? Is it election security? Well, that's a legitimate motive. Is it trying to disenfranchise black voters? That's an illegitimate motive. It's going to be a little bit like that. I have actually another question. I think you have somebody behind you. Oh, oh. It's okay. I also have many questions. But my main question is, with the debate of affirmative action, what do you think it says about the state of America during the like racial debate with it about the idea that if we don't have affirmative action, it will decrease like minority presence in high institutions? Do you think that that is just because of the debate of maybe merits of low income and a decrease in meritocracy in merit-based admissions? Or do you think it actually has something to say about like racism in America? And is it a racial issue? Or is it, as you go, as this plays out, if you see a decrease in minority admissions in Ivy League or um, selective institutions, do you think that says something about race? Or do you think that says something more about access of low in- income and minority education at lower levels? I can respond briefly. It says something about the difference between the uh, developed intellectual capacities of the populations by race that we have an underrepresentation of some groups when we use the criteria of selection that are race neutral. That's a real thing. It's a real historical inheritance. It's what I've been trying to say here for a while. It warrants to be addressed. Affirmative action doesn't address it, but it definitely says something about race. Um, so. I'll say that. Thank you. What What's the, is is there and what is the impact beyond the university? Is this going to be, have an impact on corporate America, other parts of, of society, or is it going to be sort of legally constrained within the, the realm of universities? I'd be interested in what Randy has to say about that, because I hear that um, the guy, uh, Bloom, uh, is looking at law firms. Absolutely. You know, you got law firms bringing in associates and they're worried about racial representation. And, you know, so it could you could get out of hand. It could. I mean, it all depends on, you know, these these. It all depends on what how broadly the court wants to interpret what it has said. It could be narrow. And, you know, there are all sorts of ways to narrow it and to, you know, work out various compromises to allow, for instance, you know, race neutral, you know, purportedly race neutral um, proxies, I, which I think that's what they're going to do. But you know, that there's that possibility. On the other hand, they could, if they were so minded, really take seriously the idea of uh, no, no race consciousness. And if they take that very seriously, yeah, huge implications. So, for instance, I mean, this past year, the Supreme Court of the United States, uh, on the one hand, in higher education, it comes down with this ruling. Two weeks later, it upholds a part of the Voting Rights Act that is clearly race conscious. Now, where are they going to go? And, you know, now, you know, they could go totally, we're against any sort of race consciousness, come hell or high water, and that means in the voting realm, that means in this realm, in this realm. That's Justice Thomas's position. And that is Justice Thomas's position. Justice Thomas is probably the most full-throated, uh, you know, color blindness type, you know, person on the court. So there's there's that versus people who were more likely to sort of look for the 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 compromise position. I think that I think that the Chief Justice, I think that some of the others would would, you know, be be more sort of in an intermediate. Who's to, who's who knows? And part of it, of course, will det- will be determined by uh, who's on the Supreme Court. I mean, you know, one of the things that it seems to me, actually, there is a, 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 a note in um, Pro- Professor Lowry on a couple of occasions said, you know, uh, he's not a lawyer. And he 
he he was being that was that was you know fault that was modesty. Harvard law Harvard law what am I supposed to do that was that was <laughs> the, don't don't be don't be don't be taken in by that don't be taken in by that and in, in, in any event in all seriousness I think that's a I think that's a major 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 error on the part of people the fact of the matter is this you know the law the law is the crystallization of our mores. It's the crystallization of our ethics. It is the crystallization of our politics. Uh, some of the people who have, who actually have grappled with the law in the deepest way have been people who did not have a law degree, were not lawyers. It seems to be, in fact, that, you know, every person who is a part of this society should actually, you know, know about the law under which they live and should feel confident and willing. And, you know, there, there, there shouldn't, for goodness sakes, don't defer to the lawyers and think that they're doing something that you're incapable of doing. Not true. Um. This, you know, Professor Lau, we disagree about a lot of things. We agree about a lot of things. In fact, at the end of your, at the end of our sort of back and forth, there was a tremendous, when we at the, actually at the end, I think we we're actually pretty close. Yeah. I mean, really, I mean, I actually, you know, on the question of how we should go forward, I do think that we should really think hard about how we should go forward. As far as I'm concerned, I'm, you know, let's experiment. Let's let let's have some places go this way and some places go this way. I, I want to and, and, and see, you know, how people feel about it. Let, let me ask you this. I don't know if you saw Roland Fryer, the economist, your colleague at Harvard, mm -hmm. a former student and colleague of mine, had a piece in the New York Times in which he said the following. He said, Elite institutions, you guys don't think you're getting enough blacks, and the court has just made it harder to do that. I tell you what you ought to do with your multi-billion dollar endowments. You ought to establish uh, academies in 50 cities around the country in the urban areas that would attempt to discover the most talented young people of color, amongst others. It doesn't have to only be people of color, but they're disadvantaged. They're in public schools. They're working class, lower class in Chicago and Philadelphia and Oakland, California, and so forth and so on cultivate them, bring them up to stuff, invest the resources to uh, develop their talents so that they can compete effectively on the merits when it comes time to apply to high school. Instead of simply jiggering around with your criteria of selection in order to compose the ideal class, you can actually address yourself to the developmental challenge of bringing these kids along. How about that? So, uh, you don't have a fight with me about that. Just like you don't, you would not have a fight with me. I mean, if 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 someone could say that, if, if it all depends on what's on the table. If somebody came to me and said, "I tell you what, I'll make a trade. I'll make a trade. Uh, affirmative action out, but in is excellent K through twelve. I can guarantee you, excellent K. Show me the the best K through twelve in the United States. I will replicate that across the United States." You give up racial affirmative action in higher education. I'll give you excellent K through twelve. I'll t yeah immediately. But it's the trouble in is that's not on the table. Well, you got so to then you then you reduce to second, third, fourth. You get what you can get. I'll take what I can get. Okay. Uh, thank you both for being here. Um, both of you had sort of mentioned how the. Groups on uh, these elite college campuses that tend to be the have the highest representation are upper middle class uh, students. And some an alternative I have heard to the uh, racial preference form of affirmative action is a class based affirmative action. And um, I'm not necessarily sure I agree with it, but I was just wondering if the two of you could sort of speak to that. And if your uh, either criticisms or support of affirmative action still stand um, if it were to be geared towards um, increasing representation of low-income um, students. 
Yeah, I'm favorably disposed as a general matter to the um, addressing this thing that I attributed to Jay Caspi and Kang, which is that these institutions are really uh, post prep school reserves for wealthy and powerful Americans who then have to add in a little bit of this, a little bit of that to make the thing work. And they could be different. They could understand themselves in a very different way. Um, but I think the question, though, goes to something deeper, which is if we have to uh, weigh the relative significance of racial equality versus equality, where do we put our most emphasis? Is racial equality serving as a dodge to keep us from actually confronting the larger inequality problem? We think we're okay because we have a representative class, and so we don't have to ask ourselves about the structural uh, disparities that are uh, that transcend race. Um, and uh, if that's the case, then a move in the direction of class would be would be desirable. But I want to reiterate my observation that once you do that, you're going to affect the entire character of the institution. It's not something that's working at the margins. Um, in the case of racial affirmative action, if blacks are 10% or whatever of a population and you set aside, in effect, 10% of your seats, you've got the other 90% of your seats that you can deal out any way that you want. Um, if you uh, make your criteria of selection into the university heavily dependent upon social class, uh, you may be sacrificing some of the meritocratic uh, desiderata that you uh, set out to advance when you created an elite and selective institution in the first place. The um, just a couple things. One, uh, class and race overlap, but they're also distinct. And um, it seems to me we have to sort of keep that in mind. The, um, you know, I, one of the problems with, one of my problems with uh, the camp that goes under the banner of class, not race, <coughs> is, um, you know, can you make that stick? Their, their, their theory is, well, you know, people of color will benefit from this because they're, you know, disproportionately poor. Um, question, how deep are you going to, you know, your, 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 your class excavation, how deep are you going to go with that? You know, there are a lot of, you know, lower middle class to poor white people. And basically, you know, oftentimes they, in a straight out competition for seats like, in a, you know, in a, these selective universities, they're going to beat out, uh, you know, poor, their, you know, their, 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 their people of color peers. And so... What's going to happen to people of color? I mean, I think that that's one sort of, you know, nagging concern. I do have another nagging concern. And here, Glenn, I'll be interested to see whether you think I'm being, you know, tendentious. I've been in debates with people who march, you know, if we're talking about racial affirmative action, they haul up the flag of uh, race, not class. And it, I'm skeptical of them. I say, you know, I know you. We've been in many debates. And the only time that I see any sort of egalitarian impulse in you is when we're talking about racial affirmative action. 364 days out of the year, you're not talking about, you're showing no concern about poor people whatsoever. You meant to say class, not race, right? Class, it's not the people race. who say class, not race that you're talking about. Yes. Okay, because you actually said race, not class. No, class, not race. And that's a concern that I have. I mean, I, I have the concern that on Monday, they're going to use class, not race to get rid of racial affirmative action. 
okay? But then on Wednesday, I say, well, okay, you got rid of racial affirmative action. Uh, where's the class thing? And now on Wednesday, they say, well, yeah, but we don't, you know, we don't have the money for it. You know, there's, there's, there's this problem, there's this problem, there's this problem. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm very skeptical. I want to ask you a question. So in that spirit, um, there is a lot of debate on the left uh, that says the culture war stuff is a dodge from the real issue. The real issue is capitalism, a $25 minimum wage, uh, taxing the wealthy, um, de decent social programs. But you people want to talk about critical race theory, uh, affirmative action, and whatnot. So what about that? What about the idea that a real left movement would spend a lot less time talking about race and a lot more time talking about class? Um, you know, I think it's very strong. I mean, I, I think there's a lot to that, actually. And then, you know, I've been here. I mean, I said I've, I've sort of shown it through my, you know, what I said. I'm I'm still part of the you know, sort of pro-affirmative action, racial affirmative action camp. But I think that that's a very strong position. And, um, well, I want to push it just a bit as our crowd dwindles, which is to say, we've been talking, Aaron, the pro-affirmative action people talk all the time about what African-Americans are entitled to. But you could ask the question, what do African-Americans have to contribute? And one way of putting that is to say African-Americans definitely have a historical claim on the moral imagination of the country. Put that in the service of a genuinely left mm -hmm. movement. Instead of trying to make, as in the reparations debate, a separate settlement with America where we get ours because our ancestors have been deprived, let's put our uh, political capital, our moral capital on the scale on behalf of genuine social class reform. If we were to achieve that, the most disadvantaged among us would be benefited substantially. Those of us who have PhDs and hope to get jobs at Ivy League institutions with or without affirmative action might not benefit so much, but so what? I think it's very powerful. What has that, I, I, you know, I, you don't have a, I think that's a very powerful position. And um, what can I say, you know, it's a very strong position. I have, I, and I don't object to the position. Not only do I not object to the position, I think it's something that, you know, needs to be out there. We need to think about a lot more. So let me just give, I, I, I'm a, we're about to get the Because whole, when Bernie Sanders was running for president, yeah. he got fronted by a lot of black people saying, you're on the wrong side of this, you're on the wrong side of reparations, you're on the wrong side of the racial questions, when his candidacy, as far as I can tell, is the only serious effort at the national level to bring a genuine left of center vision into American policy. I, th I, I agree with that. I think that I, you know, was very, I was appalled by the people. Now, you know, you say a lot, you know, the people who were up in his face, mal mowing him. And that's what they were doing was mal mowing him, you know, and, you know, uh, you know, people who, you know, get upset because of a word that somebody uses as opposed to the idea that somebody is espousing. Yeah. You know, there's there, there's a there's a lot of mal mowing, and that I think has been very counterproductive. And the whole idea of I, I I I think that you have really put your finger on a very important point about the use of race. I'll give a, a, an example. You know, in the in the administration of criminal justice, there's been a lot of talk. I mean, a lot of energy with respect to uh, you know mistreatment by the police. And one of the things, you know, I, I talk with uh, student activists about this a good bit. And one of the things I said to, you know, sort of, you know, Black Lives Matter activists, I said, listen, um, have you thought about this? You know, when, when, when you've made sort of, you have, you know, a number of names, a number of faces have become very famous. Everybody knows these names and faces. What about, you know... It, it's not just black people who are roughed up by the police. It's not just black people who are, 
uh, you know, put in prison for overly long periods of time. It's not just black people who are suffering from a hyperpunitive society. Um, lots of people are. And have you thought maybe of trying to make the claim? I mean, if you can believe, like you do, that a lot of white people are simply not going to be that interested in the fate of black people, might one response to that be to, you know, print up some big posters and say, hey, see this guy over here, white John Smith, white Sally Jones, they were beaten up by the police or mistreated. They are, you know, have been uh, on the butt end of the administration of criminal justice. It's not all about black people. It's about lots of people. We are all subject to, you know, um, uh, to a hyper punitive, overly, you know, overly violent society, a society that does not does not regulate the police enough. And we need to, in a sense, deracialize the campaign so that it's not just about black people. Now, I, frankly, I have not gotten a very good response to that. Um, but I think it's a good argument. I think it goes hand in hand with what you were talking about. Yeah, we agree. I want to thank uh, the three of you for such a lively thoughtful, thought-provoking discussion. Looking forward to continuing these conversations over dinner and thanks to all of you.